Good morning. I'm uh, Lonnie Lunston, and I'm a research technician in the video lab at Embari. And I'm just going to briefly talk about some of the models that we've got on FathomNet. And can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Cool. All right. So uh, I'm going to talk about some of the pre-trained models that we have available on the uh, Hugging Face model zoo. Um, so I'll go through each one of these in more detail with some examples. Uh, the models that are in bold here, um, we're really considering the FathomNet baseline models, and those are going to be updated two to three times per year as needed as more data comes into FathomNet. Um, and the other thing that I want you to know is that um, some of these models are only available in spaces, and so therefore they're not available for download. Is that correct, Kevin? So like, I believe the trash detector is just a space and not available for download. But if somebody needs that, please feel free to reach out and contact me and we can get that to you if you need it. So uh, the first not model that we wanted to talk about is the Mbari Monterey Bay Benthic model. This was one of the first big models that we trained. Uh, it has 691 classes, about 34,000 localized images from Mbari's uh, VARS database. We used Ultralytics, YOLO v5, and the uh, 5x pre-trained checkpoint um, to train for 28 epochs with a batch size of 18, 640 image size with an 80-20 image split. These classes were uh, primarily selected because they're commonly observed uh, on the in the Northeast Pacific Ocean from depth ranges of 500 to 4,000 meters. Um, and many of these animals are going to be seen throughout that entire range along the continental slope, shelf, and abyssal regions. Again, this is going to be useful for object, object detection uh, in the Northeast Pacific with similar that's, or excuse me, with video footage that's comparable to Mbari's ROV footage. Something like Ocean Networks Canada is comparable to our footage, you know, HD, decent lighting. And here's an example of what that model looks like. It performs pretty darn well. This was our very first of these big models. We actually have a couple more uh, that we've trained since this time. Again, if somebody needs that uh, more updated models, please let us know. We also have this in uh, YOLO 8 as well now. Uh, this trash detector model is an object detection model that I trained using about 30,000 localized images or localizations from about 15,000 images. Um, the training data includes data from both Embari, Jamstack, and a bunch of different uh, trash data sets that I found online. I can provide you with the list of those if you're interested. Again, we used uh, Ultralytics package uh, with the V8X uh, pre-trained checkpoint. We trained for 30 epochs with a batch size of 16, 640 image size and an 80, 20 split. Uh, this model was really trained to identify any uh, marine debris with just a single label of trash. Um, and I collapsed all the marine debris classes uh, from these existing training data sets to uh, the single class really for experimental purposes and also to aid with uh, generating basic training data from new images and video where you have unknown classes. Um, in the marine debris community, oftentimes marine debris is separated out into various classes like, you know, specifically bottles, bottle tops, glass jars, things like that. And I just wanted something that was really basic that would just detect all trash. We also have a few additional classes in there, 12, uh, that are animals that are commonly seen on these benthic dives. Again, this model is going to do a really good job detecting marine debris in a variety of habitats and depths and lighting conditions. And here's just a few examples. There's plastic bag, plastic cups, glass bottles, and uh, plastic bottles. This works really well in shallow water as well. Um, so now here's one of our baseline models. This is the FathomNet Megalodon detector. And the idea behind the Megalodon detector is that it is a single class detector. So we've taken 
all of the FathomNet data, which is about 300,000 localizations, 110,000 images. And we've collapsed all of those classes into a single class called object. This model is going to be really useful for post-processing video and images collected by marine researchers um, to use for uh, detecting objects within those videos when you don't have a model or training set available for those. So you can quickly create localized data and then correct that that makes it specific to your habitat or image collection. And again, variability, you're going to have some performance variability based on, you know, uh, your lighting conditions, camera parameters, things like that, habitat. But it does work really well. Uh, these are uh, pyrosomes from midwater. That's a Garibaldi from uh, shallow kelp forest off Monterey. And then we've also got uh, dolphins there, but I've used this in a variety of habitats, variety of images. It works really, really well. So this is the FathomNet Vulnerable Marine Ecosystems Detector. This is an object detection model that we uh, used about 54,000 localizations from uh, FathomNet training data. Again, used the YOLO V8X uh, pre-trained checkpoints. Um, this model is really designed to detect four high-level classes of benthic animals that are speci specifically identified as vulnerable marine ecosystem indicators. And we came up with these classes using the BACO et al. 2023 paper, table two, um, to determine what those classes would be. We also added fishes because it's, you know, there's an undeniable fact that fishes are often associated with VMEs. This is going to be best used for post-processing video and images collected by marine researchers to determine if there's VME indicator species in their data. And again, you know. Performance will vary based on, you know, the habitat, lighting, camera conditions, things like that. But what we're finding is that it works really well, both in shallow water habitats and deep water habitats. So we've got deep water corals here, deep water fishes, and then also shallow coral reef uh, habitats. And it's doing a really good job identifying corals and sponges and fishes in those habitats. So we're also working on these FathomNet super category object detectors. These are in prep, they're not yet completed. Uh, we plan on generating two models, one benthic, one midwater. And when we say super category, what we really mean is sort of a high level uh, morphological appearance, um, or excuse me, high level taxonomic groups with uh, similar morphological appearance. So as an example, we have a group called eel-like fishes, which is, things like zoarcids, uh, hagfish, ophidiformes, combined with true eels, the anguilliformes. So that would be our eel-like fishes group. Um, and we can provide you with a high-level name mapping for those uh, once we get the models trained. Again, this is going to be great for post-processing video and images collected by you folks um, to identify organisms at a very high level in your image data. And I don't have any examples of those yet. We also have Mbari benthic supercategory object detector that I believe Ben trained this model. Um, and this is using Mbari data. This was trained early on as we were experimenting with what these supercategory um, detectors might look like. For the benthic model, we've got 20 classes. These are basically Monterey Bay Area classes. Um, probably would work pretty well in the entire Northeast Pacific depending on the depth and your lighting conditions and things like that. We also have this uh, midwater super category detector with 22 classes, and that's going to be a very similar um, high level taxa. Um, and again, this was one of our first models that we were sort of experimenting with these super category detectors. I don't have any examples of either of those models. And then finally, I think uh, the big point here is just feel free to reach out with any questions or suggestions um, for these or any additional baseline models that you think you might want. And with that, I'll take any questions that you might have. Um, well, there, there is a question um, that was early on, and I think it could also go to Kevin. 
uh, about whether any tracking is available on these models. Yeah, sure. I can I can take that one. Um, yeah, so we, we have been doing a good deal of uh, detection and tracking workflows, um, in particular in conjunction with MBARI's video annotation and reference system, where uh, we've taken video and uh, run that through these uh, you know, tracking by detection algorithms and uh, you know, brought out the, the actual unique tracks back into the VARS database in order to get a, a better idea of over the course of the video, um, you know, how many individuals are we seeing um, you know, over time and, and for how long. Um, so, so things like that, we are uh, doing tracking on. You know, the, um, the models themselves are detection models that we have available. Though uh, frameworks like um, you know Ultralytics, these ULOV8 models are, are facilitating a lot of uh, the the tracking on top of that using you know deep sort, strong sort, um, things like this. Hi, sorry. Um, just to jump on that answer. Apologies for the background noise. Um, do you have any guidance for the tracking? Because uh, you know Ultralytics tracking uh, is uh, mainly for above water uh, car detection tracking. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we we have been experimenting a lot. We've been using a lot of the the you know pre-trained um, models for tracking there. Um, though we have experimented a little bit with um, uh, you know training re-identification networks on um, you know underwater imagery. I I, I don't know if um, Danelle or Dwayne are on the call here, but um, we did have you know a little bit of a gain in performance there. But we we've actually been sticking a lot with uh, those those models themselves, right? Just a deep sort, strong sort. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is a question, Lonnie, because you've mentioned how you're going to be retraining the the super super category models. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think I said the right word. Do do you know when that's expected to be retrained and then released? Yeah, I think Kevin and I need to meet to come up with a way to download the data and separate Midwater from Benthic. So that's probably going to happen next week. Mm -hmm. And then once we get that done, uh, it should just be, you know, a matter of days or a week to get that trained and up there. Shouldn't take too long. Great. Did thank I you. Answer that question. You did. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the chats and I'm not seeing any more. Questions. There's a question about whether models are or can be used in real time. There are, um, there is a model that's up there. Um, the specifically the midwater, Fathomnet and Bari midwater detector that's been used in real time on our ROVs uh, for autonomous animal tracking. Um, so that at least addresses that. But I'd say most of the models are are run after the fact. Um. I have used one of the YOLO V5 models in real time at sea on just like a laptop actually. And what I did was I strided it. So it was doing, you know, one frame per second or something like that. Um, and that worked reasonably well. Uh, I think maybe Kevin or Ben could probably talk about running these in real time on different types of uh, compute devices. Yeah, sure. I can chat briefly about that, um, you know, how we've been running them in real time currently on our ROVs is we're sending the video stream back up to the ship and then running it on a you know, higher powered uh, GPU laptop. Uh, we are now looking a little bit on, on how we can actually downsize some of these algorithms to embed them on the, the hardware on um, the ROV or on an autonomous underwater vehicle as well. Um, and then there's a question from Matt. I'm not sure if I missed this. Is there an average certainty of the label classes? Um, I think this is where we're going to point you to the model cards to look at the model metrics so you can see the specifics around uh, certainty of, and performance of, of particular label classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think in general, we've been getting around 0 0.7, 0 0.8 uh, mean average precision on a lot of these models. Hi, yeah, so sorry, just to follow up on that question, because I've, uh, well, I, I didn't ask that question, but I have like a similar one. Like I've also been using, I think, FathomNet data to train some of my own models, and I've, I've encountered like a class imbalance issue. Like you don't have a lot of localizations for a lot of the classes. I'm just curious how you were able to address that uh, in your training. 
So one of the things that we often do is collapse uh, similar classes or uh, say at the genus or family level, collapse those localizations into one group. So as an example, instead of different species of Coryphenoides with low numbers, you might uh, collapse those into Macruidae. And so that gets your numbers up for similar looking groups of animals. And that really helps with that class imbalance. Right, yeah, because I did the same thing with super categories. Uh, and for, for example, in like for black coral, like there weren't a lot of uh, instances, like localizations, and mm -hmm. I was getting really poor performance on those. Like, uh, did you encounter the same problem or were you able to like find a way to solve it? Uh, so with black corals, uh, I can't remember the exact number. Uh, with the super category, we just basically put all the corals together in one group. Um, with Mbari's data, we probably have more black corals and we just lump those all together. But this is sort of to that point of like the more data we get into FathomNet, the better performance we're going to get from these models. So I think, you know, the point there is that everybody needs to contribute data to make these models perform better. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. And I see you've written something in the chat, but I think it'd yeah, be- Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll say it all out, I guess. Uh, there's a, also just a number of different training strategies you can accomplish as well for basically smoothing out your class imbalances, right? So your data sampler, and, and this is something that you would probably have to go into the actual training code. Some of the, some of the um, architectures have this built in as an option, but Basically, you can do it either at the sampling le level, so you can work on creating balanced batches or balanced samples, which will cause you to kind of oversample your lower population to mitigate the fact that a natural collapse solution will just to be call everything the most common uh, thing. The other thing to do is to actually weight your loss function by your classes, so you can have basically an inverse uh, weighting function associated with that. So those are just some strategies for dealing with class imbalance. A lot of the more modern architectures that start from pre-trained um, kind of uh, baselines are already kind of well well balanced at the object detection part of things. And really where you're going to run a lot into this is kind of probably at the label level, 